Do you have solo economic dependency? That is, if you aren't working, you aren't making money. The Art of Passive Income Podcast is the solution. Discover passive income models so you can enjoy life on your own terms. Let freedom ring. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky. This week's roundtable compilation theme is going to be on team. And we all know that we're only as successful as our team. And building that team is so important to get to that next level and to really scale your land business. Because the last thing we want is to build ourselves another job. And these two podcasts where we talk about the outsourcing truth bombs and how do we pay, how do we pay our VAs for social media marketing are great reminders of that as well. So hopefully, hopefully you're enjoying your July and I know I am and enjoy the team focus this week for the round table. So Scott Todd, what is our topic for the week? You know, Mark, um, I, I kind of get, I kind of get uh, my my blood pumping when I see um, comments like this, and this is from the uh, the Facebook group, and you know basically someone is is asking on there, you know they they feel like they're wasting their time by creating training material to do something like due diligence, for example, when um, you know they're not even quite sure not even quite sure of what they need anyway, right? Like they're, they're trying to focus on other things. And the comment in there says like, I'm trying to be a land investor, not a VA trainer. And, you know, I, I get it. I understand it. And, you know, so then what happens is they're looking for kind of someone else's VA's training material. Okay. Like, Hey, any tr- training material? Well, due diligence is one that, you know, there are people that, that know how to do this, but I'd love to know everybody else's kind of mindset behind how do you create training documents or how do you cre- how do you train VAs to go do something? It can be due diligence or something else. So like, how, how do you train VAs? It's a great, great topic. Scott Bossman, let's start with you. Yeah, so I'm a firm believer. I mean, I, I think a lot of people try to do, they try to outsource too quickly without knowing the, the every single step in the process. So for me, uh, I need to do it a number of times myself and I need to map out that process line by line by line or use uh, mind mapping uh, software or something like that uh, and then be able to not only write it down but be able to describe it to somebody so be a training video or something like that or talking through it. Uh, so you got to dial down the process, do it repetition, repetition, repetition and then when it becomes wrote to you, um, it's, it's time to get rid of it. But I think, you know, you need to have those processes down. And uh, I think for me anyway, uh, the more these things are mapped out, the more linear it seems and feels, the better people do things. And um, that's, that's kind of our approach. Totally makes sense to me. Absolutely. Uh, the technician, Eric Peterson, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I do agree that uh, most of the time you're going to have to have a real good understanding of how to do whatever it is that you're asking someone else to do. But there are instances in this business where um, it's not necessarily something that's specific to our business of buying and selling land, and it's maybe a little more general around real estate. And there are people out there that, that might know how to do that stuff already. So in the example of due diligence, um, you can probably go out to Upwork and find somebody that knows how to do due diligence without having to educate them on the entire process. Um, you know, I think, I think back to when I first started, um, you know, kind of like Scott just described, you know, I would um, really spend a lot of time on a process and getting it all nailed down and put into a system and, and trying to make it foolproof. Um, before I would give something to a VA. Um, But I've really learned over time that oftentimes for, again, the right kind of tasks, um, we can can kind of take some of that um, building of processes or systems off our plate in a sense by potentially having a, 
a Zoom call with a VA and just kind of demoing it or maybe just recording yourself doing it and just walking through exactly what you're doing, talking about it as you're doing it. And then just taking that and rather than spending all the time to, to fully document that and put it into something, you know, either hire a VA that can just do that part for you or hire a VA that's going to do the work and actually have them build out that process at the same time. Um, and you can, you know, obviously answer questions as they might come up, but, but you don't have to be the one to build all that out all the time. Yeah, I, I, I love that answer. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd love to know what the terrorist hunter, Mimi Schmidt does. She used to manage 150 people. So this is probably like simple for you. The amount of work you do in training is completely tied to how experienced the person you hire is. <laughs> if you are hiring someone who is brand new, you have to teach them from the ground up. And Eric's right. Everyone's right. You need to understand what you're doing and have done it enough that you get it, right? To manage Java programmers, you don't have to know how to program in Java, right? But you have to have a basic understanding if there's something that's not right, okay? Same with due diligence. If you want to hire someone who's more experienced, you don't have to create all of these training materials from A to Z. In fact, it's a waste of time and will probably not get used. Because if you've got an experienced person, that means they probably are working with five, seven, 10 other investors. And if you impose your program of how you want things done, I want you to use Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever CRM you're using, then they're gonna be more likely to make mistakes because they've got 10 different CRMs they're expected to know how to use, okay? So a lot of these SMEs, you need to macro manage them and let them use what they, do what they're good at and use the tools they know how to use, right? And then all you're doing is teaching them what is specific that you have to have for your business as opposed to teaching them the A to Z process. I love that. I, I, I wish Mimi had a service where I could outsource my hiring to Mimi. And I could just be like, okay, this is what I need. I need a, a, a due diligence person. Maybe be like, okay, I'll go hire him for you. Cause I, I know what to look for. What do you think, Mimi? <laughs> sounds like take, a lot of work. <laughs> I know. You want to you take that on? No. No. I want to be at the beach. Come on. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, the big papa, Tate Litchfield. What are your thoughts on, uh, on all of this? You know, I echo what, pretty much everyone else has said, um, most of the time what we're doing, it's not rocket science, you know, it's not brain surgery. Get out there, look for somebody who's got the qualities and the skills that you want, give them a basic outline of what you expect and how you want them to do their job and uh, see what they come back to you with, right? It, it, I mean, you gotta give them some opportunities to prove themselves. And I think let go on the reins a little bit um, I've always said I'm not an expert on anything except hiring experts. And I believe that uh, applies directly to due diligence, right? I, I don't have a degree in due diligence or, you know, real estate or anything like that. I've, I've learned this all from, you know, my mentors and training and experience over the years. And as a result, I've been able to share that knowledge with the VAs that I work with closely. But most of them didn't have a background in this either. So it's been a, it's been a labor of love and taken a lot of time to get these people to where they're at now. And, um, you know, I, I kind of am open to their new ideas and their new approaches and new tools, and I will do whatever I need to and get whatever I need to, to keep them happy and satisfied. So at this point, I trust them. They're really good, but, uh, you gotta have somebody show you what you need to do. So you know what the pitfalls are. And I think that's where flight school comes in really helpful. And then as you learn to, notice these trends and these pitfalls, you can really start to outsource it to people who uh, do this all day, every single day and feel confident in what they were, they give back to you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give Scott Todd the last word on this. Scott. You know, I, to me, what, what I do, Mark, is whenever I have a, an assignment, one, I don't necessarily assume that they don't know anything, right? I think that's one of the mistakes that people make is, they think, oh, I have to prepare the training material because they don't know anything. Well, see, the reality is that people know, know things. That's why you're hiring them, right? Like if you go to Upwork, for example, and you hire someone that has a title abstractor, 
well, they know how to, how to do this stuff. Now, do they know exactly what you want? No, you have to tell them what you want. You have to tell them, but do you have to document out everything that, that, that you do? No. What I do is I, I get them on a Zoom call, right? Like the first time I'm gonna do it, I get them on a Zoom call just like this, me and you, and I share my screen with them and I show them. Like I record it and I show them, okay, this is what I'm doing. And I stutter through it. I point out things. I'm like, oh, well, that's not it. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. It's, it's not a Hollywood production. It's me being me, right? Like it's, it's, it's not polished in any way. It would be no different if you and I were in the same office together and I sat you down right next to me and I shared my screen with you. I'm going to hunt and peck and do whatever. And I'm, at the end, I'm going to show them how I come up with the due diligence, right? Like how I do it. And then I'm going to say to them, hey, why don't you try one here? Try the one that I just did. Okay, like I do that. Like we just did one together. I'm going to stop the video. I'm going to process the video. I'm going to give you the link so that you can watch the video and do one just like we just did, the exact one. Why would I use the exact one? It's because I know what success looks like, right? Like it's, I can see like, this is what I wanted so that when they send me what they're going to send me, I can compare it like, well, this doesn't look right. And then nine times out of 10, there's something wrong. Okay. Like I, I was training a VA today and I showed them how to do it. They sent me back something that's wrong. And I'm like, okay, listen, this is wrong. This is wrong please go back and watch the video again and figure out like how you got it wrong. And they did that and they came back to me. Right. And I'm like, perfect. But you see, like the thing is, is that I'm willing to invest the time with them 30 X the time. And what do I mean by that? I mean, like if the task takes me an hour, I'm prepared to spend up to 30 hours training them and not just training them, but working with them guiding them, mentoring them. Okay. Like I don't need to write all of the policies and the training manuals. I just need to show them what I'm doing. They will come to the project with their own thoughts in mind and they'll do it their way. But at the end of the day, all I'm looking for is this, and I don't really care what this looks like. And then I would say to them, do you have a better way of doing this? If so, do it. And by the way, please, document what you're doing, make me a video of what you're doing so I can learn from you. Because after all, I am paying them, right? Like I'm paying, I'm paying for their brain. And when I pay for their brain, I have the right to download the data that's in there that they have. I should be able to learn from them. And if it's not just for me to learn, it's for my next VA to say, Hey, look, look at how this guy did it. Right. And, and maybe this guy's a train wreck, but that's also why I don't just hire one I hire three and I give them the same project, same video, same property to do due diligence on. Why? Because one's going to be terrible. One's going to be mediocre and one is going to be a superstar. Yeah. I think we got the title for our podcast, due diligence, outsourcing truth bombs. Right. I mean, these are a lot. I mean, this is a really, really valuable episode and everyone, everybody said from, from Bossman to Scott is, is really, really important. What I think is interesting is what wasn't said. Mimi Schmidt, you know what wasn't said? Just go to this company here and let them do it. Just, here's a company. This is what they do all day long. Just outsource it to, to them. Here's a service. Yeah. I'm surprised no one's just said, hey, do that. Why not? Why not? I think people want to train people, have people things do that are a little more focused on their business, right? A little more attention to detail and, and customized to their business. When you use a service, they're great. There are a lot of great services, but I don't think you get, uh, that person's distracted by a lot of other things too. No, you know, absolutely. I, mean, I think it's, it's the difference in philosophy of management in-house versus um, outsourcing it. And depending on where you are, I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily going um, to one of these services, but ultimately if you don't train your own team, your own people, you're not bulletproof. And you're also going to be paying a lot more in the long run as well. So, you know, when you get to be a big company, let's say, 
let's just use a, a company, they always have in-house counsel. Why? It's a lot less money to have in-house counsel versus going to a, one of these big law firms and paying for legal work every time there's a legal issue and paying $500 to $1,000 an hour versus having your own person there that understands everything intimately in, in doing that. Does that make sense? Eric Peterson, what do you think? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you can definitely outsource something like due diligence to a service that is out there and, and offers that as a solution. Um, but I think you're exactly right. You're going to pay more money and you don't get kind of the, the customized treatment that, that you might want. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, there's something in due diligence that, that you want to pull that, you know, they don't normally do. It's a lot harder to, to get a service to add something that they don't typically do than it would be for you to train your own VA to just make that part of the process. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think this has been a really, really valuable podcast. So the first question I'm going to ask, and we are going to start with Eric Peterson, is Eric, how do your VAs charge you for posting ads, say on Facebook, Craigslist, landmoto.com? Do they charge you hourly or do they charge you per ad? And what do you recommend to your coaching clients? So um, it does depend on the platform. Um, Facebook, Landmoto, other land selling websites, those are going to be hourly uh, in terms of how we pay. Uh, Craigslist is going to be by the stuck ad as opposed to hourly. Um, so the reason for that, you know, Facebook and, and the other land selling websites, um, you know, it, it's really just the time it takes to, to get those ads out. And in, in the case of Facebook, maybe your poster is also responding to leads. And, and that's really an hourly task, in my opinion. Um, but when we start talking about Craigslist, um, it's not really effective to pay by time because number one, we want to encourage lots of speed. Um, but number two, some of those ads that they post are non-productive, uh, mainly because they don't stick or they get flagged. Um, so as you know, the buyer of, of the person's time that's doing that work, I want them to post successful ads and that's what I want to pay for. So we kind of build our pay structure around that. That's kind of our incentive. If you get a stuck ad, it's X amount of dollars per stuck ad or X amount of cents per stuck ad. And that's the difference between the two platforms for us. I, 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 it makes a lot of sense to me. I have a feeling maybe Tate Litchfield does something differently. Tate, how do you, how do your VAs charge you? Um, I just ditto what Eric does. I mean, this is uh, Craigslist is one of those areas where you, it's a performance based, right? So if you're really good at getting ads to stick, you're compensated accordingly. The other reason I like doing it this way is I've got one VA who has a terrible stick rate, but it doesn't matter to me, right? Because I only pay him $10 a day because he's only paid to get 10 new ads posted every single day. So that works really well for us. Um, Facebook and Landmoto, it's uh, an hourly thing just because Landmoto is super simple. I mean, anybody that can fog a mirror can post on Landmoto. And I think that's the way Scott designed it. And, you know, Facebook, it's the same thing, but we just have a, a kind of a, a schedule or protocol that we follow based on profiles and when it's time to post and renew and that kind of thing. So very similar approach to Eric. Um, I think it's what we found to work best for our individual businesses. Okay. So, so far we're in total competition. Alignment. Total but, harmony. Taria, putting in the rep, Harris, what are you doing? Uh, so Craigslist is identical. We pay per stuck ad. Um, and that that's just a smart way to do it for us as well. Um, Facebook, we have both. 
So I have someone who posts hourly because she posts, but she also does a lot of the responding as well. And then we have someone who is paid um, weekly to post on all our platforms. Now we determine what gets posted and, you know, how many on each platform. So we still structure what needs to be done, but it's a weekly payment we give for all the platforms that we're currently posting on, including okay. deal of the week. Including deal of the week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Eric and Tate, do you guys pay the same people for, for your email for the deal of the week? My deal of the week team gets paid hourly. Uh, it's yeah. separate hourly. people that, uh, that manage that process for us. I could see Tate paying by open rate. I was actually just looking at my open rate this today and I was thinking, what can I do to improve this? And I'm, I was actually boxing uh, the VA this morning thinking, we need to rework this because our open rate is not where I want it to be and make some changes. That's a good idea, Mark. Maybe a little Think tiny bonus it. there, right? Bonus. Yeah. You've seen that, you seen that, like um, that. that old commercial where it's like tiny bonus day, where it's like, oh, it's what, whatever day I got $5 bonus. Right. Thinking about implementing something like that. If we can get X percentage open rate, yeah, I'll give you a nice little bonus. We do uh, compensate when they sell and that kind of thing as well. So, but uh, uh, for deal of the week, it's just that flat rate is what we pay. I think we're paying like four dollars an hour for that position. Super simple. Okay, great. The nightcap OG dude, buddy Scott Bossman, are you in alignment? With your other coaches? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we have a marketing manager that we pay weekly, a weekly salary, and he kind of oversees Facebook posting, uh, our other, uh, you know, land moto, land flip, land century, uh, deal of the week. Uh, he, he does those emails as well. And then he manages one other Facebook ad poster for us um, because we like to keep our properties separate in different Facebook accounts. So he's managing which ads are being placed in which account. So he's being paid weekly uh, on a salary basis. What, what, what's that look uh, like? Mike Zano, are you confused by this? He says a marketing manager. When I hear manager, I think he's managing the team that posts the ads. But it sounds like he's, he's the one that's doing the work. He's a, he's a little bit of both. He's got kind of a hybrid. So I shouldn't say manager, right? He's kind of managing one person. So um, we're kind of like, you know, How about especially. I thought you were looking at because he had a new strategy with like a Facebook account per property. I wanted to hear more about that. I thought that's when you started making that face, but I was confused. I like that. You got to talk more about your strategy. And that, I mean, whether he's the manager or, you know, he's kind of the manager. He's, he's managing the whole thing. I mean, it's a terminology thing. Okay. He's a working manager. There's nothing. Yeah. The working that. manager. Precision of language matters on this podcast. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds expensive. We, we need to be nah. clear. So he's a specialist um, or a manager? He's a specialist. Let's he's do a specialist. That. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. All right. So that's so you. But, he does, but he does. He does manage one person. Yes. Correct. So then that's fair. That's fair. He's a. He's a supervisor. He's. Well, I mean, you no. Know, yeah, because the one person, but know, he's doing the most of the ads. On on the fire department, I'm a lieutenant, but I'm I'm a I'm a working supervisor. So I get the I get where he's going with that. I think there is such a thing. This is what happens when you don't work in corporate America for too long. You just don't know <laughs> what anyone does with their titles. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, but it's you know what though I think it's fun to stir the pot with Scott Bossman. So, and I like to see Mike Zano coming to his, his that's rescue. That's so nice of him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is a working supervisor. I think that's uh, like Taria said, that's a, that's a, it's a valid term. There you go. <laughs> so Mike, in, in what ambitiously lazy way do you work with your VAs to do your marketing? I'm in alignment with what's been said so far. We have the hourly rate for all of the posting except for Craigslist because there's such variability in um, getting the ads to stick and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know much else to add. You know, 
I, I, I guess I, I guess I like going like first bet mark. I guess uh, going last now. It's like everybody. I, I'm feeling the pain of being last now. I, I guess I can't be satisfied, right? Because now, like all these wonderful things have been said, uh, yeah. we still have to hear from Scott Todd. So I know we'll have that. But uh, you know, yeah, hourly hourly pay for the uh, for the marketing team uh, manager supervisor uh and um you know uh, per ad with the uh, craigslist so and uh no much else to add to that i'm not really loving this spot on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> so hard okay well, well we're circle back on the next question first to you mike <laughs> there you go it'll get boomerang right back but scott todd you're gonna be the anchor on this how do you handle? How do you work with your VAs, charging them for for ad posting? Yeah, so you know Craigslist, you got it. You know, uh, pay pay per ad stuck, right? Like that, you're paying for result because Craigslist is finicky, and you know they take them down whenever they want and whatever. Everybody else kind of falls within that hourly range, right? Like I don't really pay for results. I do like the the concept that Tate was saying, like pay for uh, an open rate. To someone blasting out the email, but um, I don't do that today. It's a good idea, but maybe a bonus for someone like that. Anything above ten percent, twelve percent, twenty percent? What would what, what you bonus that? What, what's a what's an outstanding open rate? Well, I mean, I think that I think it's about growth, right? You know, like I think that you've got to look at what your baseline is today. And then grow it. So, hey, listen, if you, you know, if you get the open rate to, you know, 10% higher or the click rate, right? You got to figure out which one of those metrics is important to you. Is it the open rate? To me, the open rate is garbage. Why? Because the open rate depends that they open, they didn't do anything with it. The click rate to me is more important. Okay. So like figure out your baseline and then figure out what you want to improve it for. Like, hey, 10, you know, 10% better. I want, look at your average and say, I want it better than this. But, you know, really what it comes down to on that open rate, Mark, is very simple. It's it's the it's the headline like the open rate is the headline. And then the click rate is the offer. Right. Like if you're not getting that click rate, one, they didn't open it. And two, like they didn't take action on it because your offer is not good. It's not connecting with people. So you can pull a lot of data out of just those two metrics, like what people are thinking about what you just put out there. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So Tate, you got to do the. Yeah, it's not just it's open plus click, right? So they got to really work on that headline plus the call to action to get any any bonus. For sure. Yeah, and I was going to say you got to know what your baseline is. So whatever you're you're achieving currently, you got to figure out how much you want to double that or triple that percentage. And, go accordingly but i'm with scott really it's about the clicks yeah i i do think there is a general metric overall which i think if you get a 10 percent or above open rate it's really good now i don't know necessarily in what it is in our niche because i know people have a much higher open rate um i'd imagine the click-through rate is around two percent i think generally wow. but i could be wrong i have to go to the googles and the interwebs and get some updated information. Scott Todd's making that face. Like, Mark, you have no idea what you're talking about. I think it was because you said interweb. <laughs> no, he said the Googles, and that's like, that's the Googles. I mean, we just literally, I just have a feeling like if you were to look at our audience retention graph right there when he said the Googles, everybody just like plugged out. Uh, All right. <laughs> you know, for your, for your people, Scott, I should have said Bing. For the people that are on Bing, they can do a what, really what nice is, search. What is Bing? I don't even know what that is. What are you? What your surface you does. Your surface yeah. never being. Oh, my surface. Yeah, that's what comes on that surface. That's right. <laughs> that's that, surface that's baked in there, baby. <laughs> the the so, surface uh, does not know that. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.